know thyself, right? So, so today we will start with whatever it is you brought with you to class, because I don't wanna, you know, I've done the video, I've done my talking, and then I'll just try to talk enough to get you going again. I think I said two questions, so there should be two rounds. And then we'll go to comparing Jesus and Socrates and the Sermon on the Mount and the virtues and, you know, lots of things. But everything I'm teaching you would have been standard curriculum for, I don't know, at least 1,500 years, just very generic. Um, all right. All right, so who do we start with? Um, I guess I guess I don't want to show this on the screen. I'll just look at you in the face, but this is what I was thinking of. Um, so go ahead, Michael. Um, so I'm just gonna do one of my one of the questions right now. Um, so I was referring to question six. Um, which says if one person acts uh, virtuously because this is what they think of as natural and necessary for human well-being, and another acts virtuously because they're a Christian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I said that I think at our core, uh, we should be acting virtuously because this is what we think of as natural and necessary for human well-being. Um, I think this uh, is what we should be shooting for as like a society um, because I think that um, it's more like it's more important for the stability of our society to be virtuous regardless of the uh yes yeah, so it's more important for the um stability of our society um to be virtuous regardless of the reasoning um but i think that when you connect it with religion like on the other hand um and you see like instances where people kind of falter within religion and in turn um those like virtues um that can lead i feel like to a lack of trust within the religion and in turn like you as an individual may not stay as virtuous um and then i said um if we could base being human on these virtues rather than base the virtues as connected to religion i think that it could lead to like a better overall society uh, with more people like participating in said virtues um but i also recognize that for many people to teach and pass on and understand the virtues um like they need the religion they need that they need that portion of that aspect um so like kind of in conclusion to me it kind of feels like a little bit of like a feudal cycle um because you need the religion for the virtues but at the same time i feel like having the religion can actually set you back in a way right so the answer is simply to examine yourself right <laughs> Right, to, to not have a one size fits all jacket that you put yourself in, but keep examining. Go ahead, Mary Hannah. Uh, just another question I was just going next. I did one, of, it was kind of one of the easier ones for me, was uh, give an example of three friends. Um, number question number four. So, usefulness, I took that as like um, practical. I didn't really. No, exactly. That's how I, know how I took that. So like I have a friend that's practical. I have a friend named Candace who's very sets goals for herself, works really hard to achieve them. And it's just kind of has all her ducks in a row, everything prioritized and those priorities come before everything. Um, and then pleasure, I took this as someone who does things that she wants to do versus things that she probably needs to do that things that make her happy, but they might not always be the right things to do. Um, and I have a friend just like that. Sometimes I kind of lean towards that even, but, um, and then the common pursuit of some virtue, um, this one was harder for me. I didn't really understand that one as much, but just someone who just is very strong to their, like their morals and is very, uh, I didn't really know how that one was supposed to go. Like ethics, I didn't really understand that one, but those other two really stuck out to me. What do you guys think about the The key is what is it that binds you with this friend? So you might have a friend that's emotional, but that isn't when you are 
engaging as friends, you're doing maybe volunteer work or something, right? Um, but if, if you have a friend where it's a good drinking buddy or it's, you know, it's good re stress reliever because they're sort of impulsive and you're not, and they sort of make you feel better or something like that. Does that make sense, Mary Hannah? Um, well, the other thing is that going to college is finding friends that you are in a sorority with or fraternity with or a club with and you're actually exercising the virtues of ruling and being ruled, right? That's that's the structure. It wasn't supposed to be just a party. <laughs> Does that make sense, Mary Hannah? So, so do you have friends at Lion that what brought you together is um, activities of, I don't know, volunteer activities or? Um, I play basketball, so I'm pretty um slammed with that usually but i did like make clicks with people who we shared the same beliefs and the kind of the same goals like we became closer because of those reasons at lion um well the other thing is the scholar athlete that's a big deal at lion right and so you're supposed to a sound mind and a sound body so lion is designed where it's not a super professional specialized, it's just the whole person. Does that make sense to you? Is that the way the basketball team sort of operated? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Who wants to go next? Um, yeah, I'll go. Um, I kind of go off of number, number six, the same question that um, Michael did. And to me, it kind of plays into um, what you asked yesterday about like, where should the line be drawn with the um, separation of state and religion? Um, you, I think you said something along the lines of like um, some, I don't know who it was, but someone that you mentioned said that the reason why th these type of things are happening is because we're um, falling away from God and we need religion to be like, build those virtues and morals, but I, I think that comes down to you as a person to build your um, virtues and morals. And if you need like a, an outside acting entity in order for you to be virtuous, I think that kind of um, defeats the whole purpose. Um, kind of like, I think I think religion would in some cases further your virtuousness. Like you as a person to build yourself and your character, you have to work on that to, um, you know, find like uh, find your virtues, um, where your morals are, what you believe, and then religion, whatever it is you believe in, furthers that helps um, build upon that to make a better foundation. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Um, I will, because I also did number six. So, I guess really like my main point with number six was. I feel that if someone is being truly like virtuous and that's just how they are in society, I feel like it doesn't really matter what the reasoning is. I think that morals come from religion, but I don't think that, I don't think that it really matters if they are actively being virtuous in society. Well, it matters if they're being virtuous. It, what I think you're saying it matters if they, what the reason is. Well, I'm saying like whether they're virtuous because it's beneficial to society or because their religion says that they should right. be. It's if the they are virtuous, yeah. I think yeah. that. Yeah. That's right. That's I think that's what you meant. Yeah. I um, kind of agree with Caitlin because my main point was that I rather you be nice for yourself than to not be nice at all. Like if you want to be nice to somebody so they can be nice to you does it really matter the reason like I'd prefer that than you saying or thinking that I just want to do something good for this person only because I want them to do something good for me since that's selfish I'm not going to do it at all like it's better you just be virtuous than to not be virtuous okay for its own sake 
right? You take pleasure in right. it. So here's a question, ulterior motives. So you don't have any ulterior motives, right? What if somebody says, I don't know if there's an afterlife or not. It's just not motivating me. But I question anybody who thinks there is because it brings in an ulterior motive, right? That how can they, they're not necessarily doing it just for its own sake. If they've got this reward punishment thing in their, in the back of their mind, right? Does that make sense? I mean, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I can, I know enough people to know people think that, right? Nobody who, you know, puts the final, the last judgment as their, you know, cornerstone for behavior is truly virtuous for its own sake. Does that make sense? Yeah. And actually, this kind of brings me to, I also did number three as well as six. So I'll go ahead and give my answer to three since it kind of relates. So for people who perform virtuous actions, or let's see, give an example, virtuous but not. My idea was I took more of a business approach, especially when it comes to sponsorships and stuff, because you know they're only openly publicly supporting something because you for publicity and you, that they'll make more money off of it. So it kind of relates to what we've been saying and and it kind of relates to what I said that it's better that businesses share or donate to others, even if it is for a selfish reason, than for them to not do it at all. Right. I used to teach business ethics and there was this um, seminar where we were, some guy from the business world came in and spoke and he said, okay, so business ethics is trendy. So everybody in my business is, is into it because that's the way to get on the right side of the public, <laughs> right? He just, whatever, it's the latest trend. At least he was honest, right? <laughs> that it was clearly an ulterior motive, uh, but you can even say, you know, you you have a responsibility to always have that as your as part of your motive. Otherwise, you're not giving your shareholders, you know, the dividends they deserve if you do something without thinking about profit. <laughs> that's that's pretty cold, right, Titus? But there are people who think that. Does that make sense? Um, because there are movements like corporate social responsibility, right? That would be a sponsorship. And there are people who've argued that there, there's no such thing and managers who do it are irresponsible because their only responsibility is to make a profit. Do you think that's true? I think some people are specifically hired to give business ideas that could make profits. But as far as everyone in that business, I don't think everyone's goal is that. Right. So the other side of the argument is that businesses cannot do well unless there is people live in neighborhoods that are safe and their kids are getting a good education and they have good health care. So those things are part of actually running an efficient business. So they're not social responsive generosity as opposed to doing well as a business. Everybody understand that? It's a, it's a different philosophy, but I actually think that one corresponds to reality better than the other one. If you're just in it for the profit, you're gonna have more people workers um, struggling and getting sick or their kids are struggling in school. You're gonna have more absenteeism. You're gonna have to more people distracted. You're gonna have more people quitting. You're gonna have more turnover. So um, 
uh, you know, Aristotle would say, it all, all the boats rise or all the boat, you know, the social fabric is woven together or it's unwound. And you can't just come in there and say all that matters is money. Um, okay. So who wants to go next? Uh, I can. Okay. So I did number five, which is very long, so I won't read all of it. But the biggest question it seemed was, do you think it is possible to combine the Christian view of virtue with Aristotle's? Right. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks at length about Beatitudes. If I'm not mixing it up, he talks about the Beatitudes, which almost are a different version of Aristotle's virtues in a way. Like he talks about exalting meekness and generosity and kindness, which are all more or less Aristotle's values. So these are things as a Christian that we are taught to value. So for a very long way, they do in fact align. Uh, but we can see these virtues outside of Christianity and even regardless of religion in people like one of my favorite inspirations is Mr. Rogers, so Fred Rogers. Yes. Mr. Yes. Rogers neighborhood. And he purposefully and intentionally set out to create a show that was virtuous and that taught children virtues without pretty much any semblance of religion. And it was a very, very long process of making sure as many children as possible were included, as many people as possible were included in the production of this show to make it as accessible as possible. And almost all of his virtues align with Aristotle's as well and that they all work to promote the public good and the personal good as well. So while they're very, very influential in church rhetoric, they can also exist completely outside of religion as well. Right, that's why I do think it's important that, that college students get exposed to this, right? Because it's, it's dividing our country, right? It, disagreements about this are making the social fabric come unraveled and they're so unnecessary. And this is the foundation that our fathers had. So I will say, Amanda, as a, as a preacher's daughter, when I first read Aristotle, the ones that, that I knew was just like, oh, chalk on a blackboard was um, forgive seven times, 70 times, right? You can't run a society like that, right? So I, what I came up with was that Jesus is kind of, you get your heart in the right place, right? That you want to care about people. And then you have to start deliberating about practical things and um, governing. Does that make sense, Amanda? Yeah, of course. So like holding people accountable, but still hoping that they choose to change. So I guess rehabilitation rather than pure incarceration or punishment as a means right. of hoping they do better. Well, and giving them options so that when they do get out of prison, for example, they have a job, they have a different neighborhood to live in because they're just dumped with nothing. Um, so yeah, I do think it's chalk on a blackboard to say it's Christian just to be punitive and not to have any any plan for what they're supposed to do after they get out. I, but you know, you know as well as I do that um, people disagree and then, but I think the stronger argument is that that's Christian humanism and there's certainly nothing anti-Christian about it, right? Um, okay, so uh, Trey? Uh, yeah, so I did number one, kind of, and it was like, give an example of a person of high moral standards and which of the Aristotelian virtues this person had, which makes you think of him or her as a virtuous person. And so I was uh, kind of thinking of two of the uh, moral standards. I did courage and I did, uh, I did uh, generosity and I did honor. And for generosity, I basically did God because God was willing to forgive us for all of our sins, pretty much um and then for the honor 
I did, it said both knew what they did was honorable. So I kind of chose uh, Malcolm X and I chose Martin Luther King because it took a lot of them. It took a like, it takes a lot. It takes a big character to kind of like speak on what you believe in and kind of, you know, cause a lot of people could look at you differently for what you believe in and, and kind of like doubt you and stuff like that. But they were willing to, you know, stand up for what they believe was right. And it was just honorable of them to, you know, kind of go out of their way and, and speak on what was happening. Right. So they had moral courage, right? And then they did something honorable because it was way over and above what the laws would require. And it was for the sake of a better society, right? So the other thing about our tradition is it when Aris, when you have a standard like this, it's a standard against which you're supposed to criticize your political leaders, your religious leaders, any people with power can be assessed, right? According to these virtues. And so if you teach the public these virtues, you're teaching them to think critically about the way they use power and about the way everyone else uses their power, right? Which is what Socrates did. <laughs> Does that make sense? So I just want you to see these two things really fit together. Uh, one of them is just here's how he lived and here's you know the patterns, what he was actually doing in a, by definition according to the definition. Um, and so, oh yeah, it's not a, you know, it's a no brainer. It's not that complicated. What's complicated is to actually figure out how to live your life, right? What's complicated are the particular decisions you make. But I do think it's really a serious problem if we can't even agree that there are some basic virtues and vices and that, and that we can, you know, they change over time, but they, they don't, there is a natural foundation. That's the main thing. Um, yeah, I actually read Malcolm X's autobiography in high school. Did you read it, Trey? Uh, no, but you're gonna have to send it to me for sure. Oh, well, you know, you can buy it, I'm sure used for a buck and $4 shipping or some dang thing. Um, but in certain ways, I admired him even more than King because he did go through awful things and he came out really an amazing person. Um, whereas Martin Luther King was, you know, a preacher's kid and he had a, a more secure background and um, he had a church family, had a family, and he, then he had a PhD, right? He sort of was more of an establishment person, except that he, he, he changed, tried to change it from within, the system from within, and then it wouldn't change. And so he did this nonviolent. So um, Malcolm X went through a lot of phases, right? First he bought in, and then he, I mean, he was a, he was a drug dealer. He was a, uh, you know, in prison. He changed, right? He learned to read. Here's another big thing. Education was the key for getting Malcolm X out of his prison of his mind. And um, that story is told over and over. Education is the key. And so then he he joined the uh, Muslim Brotherhood that actually advocated violence for a while, but then he gave up on that. Um, and then he joined actually the black, the Muslims advocated peace or he changed his mind and he became a real peace person. He went to uh, Mecca and it really changed him once again. He kept growing. That's what I, he kept changing his mind, right? And he didn't take revenge. He didn't hold a grudge. It's not like Martin Luther King did. It's just that Malcolm X got tested a lot more. Um, does that make sense, Trey? Um, but there's just lots of, now there's so much literature with African-Americans telling their stories. Um, there were no, there was nothing by African-American women when I was in college and oh, wow, that's just, uh, that's been great to read that. 
But anyway, um, all right. So let me, let's go through all the questions. Anybody ha have a round two right now that they prepared before class? Anything else they wanted to say? Um, so I kind of talked similarly on question number five to Amanda, um, but I also had like a small note on question number three, I think it was, um, because it says that um, like one of the one of the things uh, for an action to be considered uh, virtuous is that the person like knows that what they're doing is virtuous. And I guess I was just kind of curious, like, what your, I guess, other people's thoughts, like, can something really only be considered virtuous if the person that does it knows what they're doing? Um, and, um, like, I understand that there are ulterior motives, um, but I was curious about whether or not being virtuous could occur on accident, I suppose. What do you guys think? Mm, I think it definitely could occur on accident, but... I don't think that will make it unvirtuous unless there was a negative ulterior motive to it. Anybody else? Uh, as, as someone who works with kids a lot, uh, children are very motivated internally. They have ideas of what they think is right and what they think is wrong. And it's very, very black and white for them. It's very concrete. And most of the kids I work with are under 10. So they're still figuring everything out. But I have never seen more kindness or compassion than from children. And it's not from a fear of punishment. And it's not from, oh, you, I know I have to be kind. I know I have to do this. I have to do this. It's because they want to. Uh, like, I want to share my snack with you because I like you. I want to share with you. I want to give this to you because you're my friend. So I think it's absolutely possible to be virtuous accidentally simply because you want to be, even if you don't know what it means to be virtuous or even if you don't know that's what you're doing. I think what it tells you is people if you really need to raise your child to have empathy, because it's very natural for them to have empathy, right? And it's really a corrupting influence when you do discriminate, when you teach your children racism or sexism or classism, it makes them very uncomfortable, right? Because if my parents don't like someone because of you know, some other characteristic, then they get insecure, right? Gee, what might they not like about me? Does that make sense, Amanda? Oh, yeah, no, I see that all the time. It's, I'll have kids who just parrot their parents and don't fully understand what they're saying. And so then when we either correct them or are very gentle, like, hey, what about this? They're almost always far more receptive to the idea of the more inclusive, more kind option than what they've been told. Yeah, it is amazing because all these PhDs, you know, they really, some of them say we're empathetic by nature. Some of them say, no, we're competitive and adversarial by nature. And Aristotle just says we're neutral, right? And we learn, but the empathy is healthier because if you want a civilization, you have to have trust and goodwill. So empathy in a child is what develops into goodwill in an adult. Does that make sense, Amanda? So that very empathy you see in the kids in an adult would be policy about prison, right? A criminal justice system where you're trying to incentivize that giving opportunities to people to have a life after, right? Does, but you now you have to be deliberate and you have to structure and you have to figure out funding and you have to you know, follow through. It's just a lot more complicated, but your heart has to be in the right place. 
And when in the name of religion or something, you have these really toxic emotions, you know, <laughs> if, if the medicine makes you sicker than you were, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> I don't know. Does that make sense to you, Amanda? Yeah, for sure it does. I just don't understand punitive, right? A punitive criminal justice system. Yeah. It doesn't work and it costs more money anyway. Like what's the advantage, but okay. Look, Lackenzie, is that how you pronounce it? Are you there, Lackenzie? Yes, Ma. Okay, did you answer any of the questions? Okay. No, Ma. Okay, so I'm glad you're here though. You can just listen and we can, you can, I think it'll help. Um, all right, so let's go to these questions. Um, and I just want to open it up. So if something comes to mind, um, all right. So some people tell me about their grandmas or their grandpas, right? And Amanda already said, right? Her grandpa is actually considered, you know, a person of high moral standards and um, preachers are like that. But does anybody else have an example offhand about somebody one having some of these virtues that stands out. I guess that could go with question two, an example of some people who stand out in relationship to either one of the virtues or one of the vices. I just wanna point out that my grandfather is a lot like your grandfather. So I, I can put that up there, but yeah. I don't want to get all into his story, but. <laughs> you know, it is kind of funny. Like my grandkids, great grandpa marched with Martin Luther King in Selma. <laughs> so, you know, I, I really like my students, but I can't say I, we have common childhood experiences, right? Um, but that's okay, you know, um, but I'm not the average grandma either, right? One of my grandkids, my son said, Grandma, where are you? Are you in Indonesia or where are you? And I thought, I thought you know, they don't make grandmas the way they used to. Uh, <laughs> um, anybody else give an example? Okay, anybody? I hope people at least don't wonder what the question is, right? Um, and then you have the next one was, whether it's an ulterior motive. And I would say that the children who have empathy, the reason why he would say you have to know what you're doing is because a kid will have, you know, if they're well raised and they're around people, but eventually they're going to run into situations where they won't want to have empathy, right? They might get burned by people. And so then you have to get it to that level of reason where you can say, no, you know, I still believe in people, right? Someone could have good intentions and then they become cynical because they've been let down. But that's why you have to make that transition from empathy to the virtue of having goodwill as a matter of reason. Does that make sense, Amanda? Okay, and it's also because once you get it to the level of reason, you can actually very deliberately teach your children or other people about it. And it isn't just sort of, it, it feels good for me to have empathy because there are gonna be times when it might not feel good. <laughs> and that's why goodwill is more important than, than just that, but it's definitely a foundation. Um, let's see the friendships. So I've talked about that again, liberal arts colleges are designed for you to create the highest kind of friendship. Um, then the other thing is that 
You can argue this on any religious view, or you can argue it from a purely evolutionary point of view. And so all those, all that animosity between people who believe in evolution and people who think that's anti-religious, really that all goes away. And our founders, United Reason and Faith, the churches, but the Church of England, which is the Episcopalian Church in the US, the Methodist Church, all of the churches in England or Europe that united reason and faith all accept evolution, right? They don't have a problem with it. So it's the churches that split reason and faith that also um, think, deny evolution. And again, our founders would say that's fine if you do it in church, but they would be very much, they would be very worried with a law like in Arkansas, where you have a choice of whether you teach creationism or evolution, that would be a big red flag for them because they do think, especially now, kids need to learn science in order for our economy to function and in order to have a middle class, right? And evolution is just scientific method right? You don't have to, it's not the meaning of life. It's just how did people get to that view? Well, the, through observing data, right? So, um, so that's the point I want to make that, um, again, there is no need for all of that animosity and all of that polarization. So when you get caught up in it, and you will if you already haven't, right? You could at least say there's really no need for this, right? Um, all right. Okay, so that's that was you know a main thing I wanted to get across today. Um, let's see. So here's the the list of virtues. You go from personal to political. And I did that, I did that on the uh, whatever. Now let's do the Sermon on the Mount. I went over that pretty fast. Okay, everybody think of a couple points in the Sermon on the Mount that struck them, right? This is Jesus when he, he you know, he gets his sense of mission and Jungian archetypal psychology, the world's mythological tradition, but every average story, life story, involves in the late 20s. So psychologists will say your brain sort of keeps growing until sort of your late 20s, and then it starts to synthesize things. And so, so many people's life story is about 27, right around there, I finally figured out what I really want. And that's what happened to Jesus, okay? Um, and that's when he got baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. He began to preach, calls his disciple, heals the sick. Um, here's the Beatitudes, yes. So Amanda, as a preacher's kid, that was, I had that same thought, right? that the Greek view of virtue is just like Socrates, right? He appeared to be a stone cutter. He actually was really virtuous. He appeared to be a sophist. He actually was not, right? And so people got totally mixed up. Well, the same was Jesus, right? So the people who Jesus had difficulty with were the Sadducees, the rich religious leaders, which would be the mega church people, and then the Pharisees, who were the literalists. So those would be the fundamentalists. Because, you know, he did say to them, um, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So, uh, and this happened more than once, but some women are collecting uh, wheat on the Sabbath because they're hungry and they're poor. And so after the harvest, when uh, the owner of the field is resting for the Sabbath, 
then they are picking some of the stuff that fell by the wayside, which is okay to do. It's just that they got criticized for doing it on the Sabbath. And Jesus just said, you know, wait a second, that's too legalistic. So, um, so Jesus had trouble with them and they took him, right? They wanted to get rid of him because he was criticizing them. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. This is where I talked about, I have, he says, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So he cares about purity of heart, right? And then the um, adultery. So I was saying, you know, is this true of every Christian these days? Um, do women dress as if they don't want men to think lustful thoughts when they see her? <laughs> divorce. Um, all right. So what did each of you, how did each of you, what did you find in that reading that struck you? Let's see. I'll start with um, Jason. I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? What did you read in the Sermon on the Mount? That stuck out to you. That's all. Um, yeah, I I didn't read the sermon. I'm not, I'm be honest. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Caitlin, did you? Yeah, I kind of skimmed through it, and I had heard it before, read it before. It's just been a while, but um, one of my the things that stuck out to me was when he said it's better to like lose one part of your body than for your whole body to just go to hell if your right hand causes you to sin cut it off and I like didn't really like I obviously it's not that literal of a statement like if your hand don't cut it off but I think it's just interesting because I guess I don't even know what to relate it to that's just the one thing that stuck out to me that made me think the most and maybe I just haven't thought enough to make a whole sense of it but it stuck out to me okay people don't talk about doing that right <laughs> it's not a litmus test anymore uh mary hannah what do you think um just kind of going off what caitlin said about the if i um your right hand cut it off thing i'd actually seen a movie where he was using it like inappropriately and he actually cut off his hand but um obviously that's fiction but just to go off of it um about i think it was in your video how you said or if i read it somewhere else i just remember reading about how you dress going to church was it in the video i think yeah and that kind of stuck out to me because that just made me think like there's a time and place for everything and like the right place at the right time just things like that that kind of stood out to me a lot how you don't dress certain ways going to church and it's something I've always been told growing up like my dad does like touch your toes and if it covers everything then it's a dress like it's appropriate and I just it kind of stops me just reading off of that technically though you know you wouldn't ever dress in a way that would draw male lust right and and men would never feel lust when they look at a woman is that true guys yeah, you're totally pure in heart, right? No prob. <laughs> and the other thing is it's not supposed to be repression, right? It's supposed to be, oh, no, I don't want to feel lust, right? Okay, so we got a ways to go, folks. Uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead, Trey. Uh, so I kind of had two of them, of the servant on the mountain. Uh, there was one that said, do not divorce unless your spouse is unfaithful and do not marry a divorced woman. So kind of with like the only the, the do not marry the divorced women, I think it could go both ways. Like, as, I guess if, you know, both people get divorced and it's kind of like, ah, like, why would you get with somebody? I don't, I don't really see the problem with getting with somebody that's divorced, but I guess that's how they, they're explaining. I could probably do some more research on that. But, um, I definitely agree with the do not divorce unless your spouse is unfaithful because you don't want to just set yourself up kind of out on the street or something like that. Or 
I guess, you know, if they haven't done anything wrong or, you know, I haven't done any harm to you or something like that, I don't really see a, a, a position in why you would want to divorce that person. Uh, and then another one I had, it said, you cannot serve both God and mammon, which is money. And it said, live for the sake of virtue, justice, truth, God, not for money. Do not be anxious about money or mere survival. Be anxious about being good. So I think what that's kind of talking about is just kind of do good for yourself and don't worry about like other things that's not really a main topic. I mean, of course, you know, money is is a lot in, in today, but money is not everything. And so you don't want to revolve your, your, your life all around money and stuff. I would say kind of like, you know, just kind of improve yourself and do better for yourself before you start worrying about like money, I guess, pretty much. Is that the way Christians, have you ever heard of the prosperity gospel? Love it. If you're successful, if you make money, it's a sign that God has blessed you. Oh, really? <laughs> There's over 3,000 quotes in the Bible against greed. Hello. Um, uh, so I don't think Americans are perceived as uh, really taking that seriously, that you can't worship both God and money, and you shouldn't be anxious about money. I, I think in a capitalist system, you are sort of, you are uh, conditioned to care a lot about money, right? So it, you know, it takes a lot of effort not to, but really that's what the Bible says. So if you're going to be a literalist, right? I mean, people have, you know, I mean, this people will quote from the Bible, right? One quote. And like, if you didn't follow that, you're not Christian. It was like, but they, <laughs> there's lots of quotes, you know, and there's plenty of people in church that are divorced. Um, but I think actually, if you want to check out the idea that people take divorce too lightly, right? Um, but there are a lot of alcoholics who become abusive. There's a lot of abuse in uh marriages there's a lot of people actually that don't have the moral strength to have a long-term committed sexual relation raise kids together that takes a lot of moral virtue it really does and so i sort of thought you know when i was your age because i didn't know very many people were divorced at all um and i thought you know that would never happen to me <laughs> And then, you know, life gets complicated. So, so you could at least look up what some of the reasons are. Um, and then I think I mentioned in the video that sometimes, even though it's better for kids to have two loving parents raising them, there's, I think there are people who decide for the children's sake to get divorced right? Lots of times they decide for the children's sake not to get divorced. But I do think that's one of those questions of practical wisdom. It depends upon the person and it depends upon if they want to change and it depends upon, does that make sense, Trey? Would you ever want to live in a society where it's illegal to get divorced? No, no way. Yeah, okay. Uh, my students, um, half of my students or more in my other school do live in places where it's illegal and they write about it too. Not, I don't think you want to live there. <laughs> um, okay, good. I, good. That's great. Who else wants to comment on the Sermon on the Mount? Amanda. Uh, so this seems somewhat important since Jesus talks about it twice, once in the Beatitudes and once in his own section of love thy enemy. And it's blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I just, as a history major, I just find it terribly ironic because of all the wars of religion. Obviously like biggest one being the crusades and how many millions of people were killed in the name of religion when your religious figure is telling you that war is bad, that violence is not the answer, and that peace 
is what you should be seeking instead of for. And I think it's terribly funny. And additionally, in the Love Thy Enemy, how often we hear preachers, especially in larger megachurches, uh, talking about killing your enemies, crushing them, conquering lands, when that's not at all what Jesus says. And he talks to forgiveness and love and turning either cheek quite famously and just how we should be forgiving and kind and emphasizes peace as a virtue rather than war and forcing religion and forcing your virtue on people. And he did emphasize purity of heart, right? In spite of however you get treated, right? So it wouldn't be, well, we have to protect our own or something. You know, maybe you think that, but that's not what he taught, right? I mean, that's where, again, I just, I am not a pacifist um, because I do think it's a matter of uh, decision. I do think 90% of wars are unnecessary, right? But I don't want to just have a one size fits all because sometimes it's just that most of the time, not only that, at least in many countries in the world, a politician cannot go to war unless he talks about God, right? And, you know, so God loves war as far as we can tell from the politicians. So that, that's a part of political rhetoric if you, if you want to go to war. So, yeah, it's, I, and the other thing I want all of you to think about is what is history saying about the time the times when you are stepping into college, right? I had, you know, I was in college in the middle of the 60s, but nobody really pointed that out to me, right? That this isn't normal. <laughs> this isn't the way things have been. Nobody pointed that out. I just sort of thought, oh, every high school kid that gets straight A's hates high school. Uh, you know, everybody's dad disagrees with their authority figure at school. I mean, all this stuff that unless some adult would tell you, wait a sec. Okay, so just think about how much, if, if history is going to call our country, you know, at this is a uh, particular flourishing time in our country, or if it's a time of decline in our country, and, you know, what's your place in the midst of the spirit of the times, right? And, and it's complicated. We have Black Lives Matter and we have um, the climate change. There's lots of different issues. So try to see yourself as a historical character, right? So Plato grew up and he watched Athens fall apart. And so he decided that's what I can teach people about. So you can decide what did I grow up with and what can I teach people about because I just happened to live at a time when this happened to be going on. And even if you're in the sciences or whatever, in terms of your contribution to the culture, you can, you can um, contribute in lots of ways. So I do think a lot of Lions students have a lot to contribute to strengthening our social fabric because they do come up, come in, they tend to come in with more uh, fundamentalist kind of religion. And then I think for most of them, these virtues make sense. And so they can make that transition and then they could carry that forward back into their, just their, they don't have to officially get paid for it but they can just sort of change the culture that way. Does, do people understand that? Does that make sense? Um, all right, so who else hasn't clocked in about the Sermon on the Mount? Michael, go ahead. Um, so I looked at like the do not worry section and kind of um, how it kind of differed from like Aristotle's point of view and some of the stuff that you talked about in the video. Um, because like, let's see, the first sentence is um, 
therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. Um, and I feel like that was almost, like, almost in direct opposition of what Aristotle was, you know, talking about with, and, and what you were referring to, um, like, drinking in moderation and that kind of thing. Um, and um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, well, I remember that too. Um, so again, in, in religion, there gets to be this self-denial, right? Extreme self-denial. So if you think people are born sinners or if they naturally want to sin, then you've got to constantly deny yourself what you want, right? And so that creates a lot of guilt. And so the Greeks would, the Greek contribution to Western culture was to sort of water that down and say, wait a sec, we're not born naturally wanting to sin or naturally wanting, you know, we're actually, it's more natural to want to have empathy. Um, and so basically um, our founders, really, they were, they were enlightenment thinkers and they changed their view of God to fit the new science. But they were very optimistic. They thought of the soul as a blank slate, except they thought you should believe in the immortality of the soul. So whatever. <laughs> But that's in your private life, you're supposed to believe in immortality. In your public life, uh, a blank slate. So, and they really thought you could form people to be more virtuous without having it to be self-denial, right? So those are just questions for, those are dialectical questions for you to think about. Um, there is a movie called Lilies of the Field. It's a very old movie. Sidney Poitier, but it's really nice. <laughs> this guy, his car breaks down right near this uh, church that's falling apart. And the nuns who live there decide that God sent him. <laughs> and so he thought he had other things to do, but he gradually, you know, um, got into sort of helping them build their church. But that was sort of the key. She, he was worried about making money and she, she quotes this quote, you know, and it kind of turns around. I guess it's, it's sentimental, but it was nice. Um, I thought it was nice. Um, okay, who else wants to do the Sermon on the Mount? Who hasn't done it yet? Everybody? I guess I'll go. Go ahead. The thing that really stood out to me was the, it was in the questions number three, where it says, you go to hell for evil thoughts, not just actions. <laughs> Should scare you, Titus. <laughs> it sounds pretty scary. <laughs> Cut off your, what, poke your eyes out, then you won't lust after women. And <laughs> Well, the thing is, it sounds funny, but just think of how many people, like Amanda said, they get so self-righteous, right? And so judgmental because it's too much repression. So Jesus also says, judge not that you not be judged. Would you say most Christians don't judge? <laughs> well, I think you can say that that's partly from repression, right? When you're repressing your desires, then you project them onto somebody else, right? Oh, they're having sex. Oh, you know. <laughs> um, so you really, if you want to have integrity, you know, you say, I don't want to have sex outside of a long-term commitment. I don't want to split my mind and my body. I don't want to get in that habit. It's it's not healthy. Ultimately, I want to be married and have kids and be faithful. So why would I get myself in the habit of splitting mind and body? Does that make sense? The thing is, like, why don't people talk like this more? That's what I wonder. Um, and I think it's just because we have that very puritanical, assuming people are sinners. That's, that's a big influence in our culture. And that's where I wish Dan were here, because he, he, he can see that. He comes from Europe. 
and they're much more humanistic. Um, all right, let's go back to some of these other um, texts so that, all right, so yeah, somebody else want to say something about the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah, I was just going to talk about the, like, the judging others portion. I know you kind of just mentioned it briefly, um, but I was going to say that I feel like that in today's society has been, like, a really, like, a, a more prominent issue at uh, churches and with religion. I think that that's, like, kind of driving some people away because we are seeing, the, yeah, I see, I feel like we are seeing a lot more judgment in the church, um, which I think is, I think that's alienating some people in some groups. Um, so that was one of the other, other, other things that I saw. I mean, it's just, um, don't, just the, the spec I problem is what I always call it. Don't criticize someone else. And, and that Socrates is a lot like that, right? He says, I try to examine myself, right? He doesn't judge others. He just asks them questions, right? And they basically judge themselves, right? But they don't admit it. Anyway, yeah, I think this is a big problem. The other problem I think is terrible is when they judge humanists, right? All those humanists, they're ruining our country, right? I don't know. Do you ever hear humanists being judged? Atheists, relativists, nobody? Well, that's okay. That is interesting because uh, after 9 11, wow, there was a decade there when it was, it was pretty awful. Um, then I pointed out ask. It depends on what you're asking for, right? I asked for a Cadillac and God didn't give it to me. <laughs> um, but if you ask for insight, right? It, you might get it, right? Um, being, not being naive, all of these things. Uh, my father told me once um, as a preacher, he said, you know, you could just sort of spend your whole life on the Sermon on the Mount. One, two, skip a few, and that would be close enough. <laughs> Um, all right, so any, were there any points in this handout that you wanted to talk about? Um, deciding on a paper topic, I gave you some ideas. Is the US like Athens? How did they corrupt their society? Um, you have to remember slavery, the Bible was quoted extensively to justify slavery, right? People forget that, I think. I mean, it's straight out of the Bible. Um, so when they also quote the Bible to discriminate against gay people, um, we have changed our minds about some of that stuff, right? Uh, anyway, but if you unite reason and faith, you do. Um, all right, so... So I asked you to reflect on these questions. Am I like Euthyphro? Am I like, you know, am I like, who am I, right? Who am I? Where would I fit in this picture? How do I think about my society? Anybody have any comments or anything about those questions? Okay. Um, let's see, questions, sermon, blah, blah. Um, uh, go ahead. Um, so for our paper, we can take either one of the topics on the one that you were just on or the other, the other file that's like titled like paper. Right. I will cover the paper. I will cover that last file in a minute. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. You. Good. That was the last one after this one. Um, all right. So what you know about Jesus, um, Bible stories, the thing, uh, there's another thing that kind of annoys me. Everybody does Bible study, right? You don't really have to have an education. You just have to have good intentions, right? And you can pick out a quote and sort of interpret it. Well, I think it's more difficult than that, right? And so, um, so we've trivialized the education of the mind where you actually are able to think about these issues much more broadly and to develop character, right? 
So we've trivialized that. And then we take very seriously, you know, we have a lot of people at very high levels of education in many, many fields. But specialization has led to a lot of the smartest people not getting involved in the society very much because they don't get rewarded for it professionally. And because um, their, special, their, their brains are so specialized, they don't really think a lot about the virtues. And then a lot of them become morally weaker because they're not exercising the virtues, right? They're just sitting in their offices. And so they can get annoyed, right? With students who have complicated lives or they can get annoyed with anybody else who actually has to deal with people day in and day out. So, um, so that, that's a big problem is that the intellectual virtues are being cultivated not in the context of the moral virtues. So uh, both Socrates and Jesus, right? They were not highly educated. They, that's the point is you can have these virtues without a high level of education. But Aristotle's model of the person with practical wisdom, the old tradition is called the obligation of the nobility. If you happen to to be smart enough and have the opportunity, have the money or the prestige to get this education, you need, you need to rule for the sake of the rule and to try to educate people who aren't that intelligent, they don't have the opportunity. So there's an informal level of public education where Socrates went to the marketplace, where Jesus, so the point of these stories is that a culture can preserve itself. You can have a strong social fiber. You can maintain a ruling and being ruled without resorting to authoritarianism. But you have the people who have the privilege have to trickle it down, right? Have to get out there and, and get involved. Okay, so Jesus, um, both of them, enjoyed food, you know, he went to a marriage ceremony. He's not repressed, right? He changed water to wine at a marriage ceremony. Um, both of them stood up, both of them had moral courage, right? They stood up to authority figures, they questioned them, they exposed their hypocrisy or their pettiness. It is, to me, it's interesting because it's, my gosh, it's the same, same stuff. Um, for Socrates, it was every sector of society. For Jesus, he focused on the religious authorities, the corruption of the Jewish uh, people. And there were the megachurch, that's the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Both allowed themselves to be killed. They forgave their murders. The cause is ignorance. It leads to delusion, self-deception. Um, yeah, so uh, both of them had goodwill. Both, neither of them took, were angry. Remember Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's very, very Greek, right? Uh, Socrates um, thought, you know, the, the human problem is ignorance. And what we call sin is also a kind of ignorance, but good intentions are more ignorance and not being informed enough, not knowing you're not informed, all of that stuff leads to evil it's it's not just people know what's evil and they are too weak and they choose it it's not like that it's a lot more complicated than that um so don't take revenge get angry for the right reason they were both honorable but they didn't worry they weren't honored <laughs> but they did you know try to point out people who were helping they both were ambitious in the sense that they spoke to people above them in the social class. Um, they both called out people. They both had friends or disciples, right? Um, they both got along with people as much as they could. They were sociable. 
they tried to bring about a spiritual renewal. And so we have spiritual humanism. That's why I, I don't shy away from the word spiritual. It's living for the sake of something greater than yourself. Both of them know thyself. They're humble. Um, they, their lives got caught up in political issues, even though they weren't primarily interested in politics, but they got abused by people who wanted to use them for their own political and economic purposes. Um, in both cases, uh, the lawmakers, okay, Jesus wasn't anti-Jewish, right? He just didn't, he just was aiming for the spirit of the law, not, and he said, I haven't come to destroy it. I've come to that it be fulfilled, right? Uh, Socrates was not trying to destroy the system. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. The criminal, so that Jesus thought the uh, Jew, Jews were, you know, losing it. They had lost track of what it meant to love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, the, obviously, the criminal justice system for Jesus was also had a problem. Um, and Pontius Pilate, he couldn't figure out why the Jews wanted this guy killed, but he thought, okay, you know. Um, let's see, if, if Socrates is the greatest gift and Jesus have the same basic virtues, I think we can say that Jesus' way of life is compatible with a democratic society. It's even a gift as long as it's not literalistic or megachurch, right? It can get corrupted by money, power, or uh, orthodoxy. But there's nothing inconsistent with Jesus' way of life and democracy either. So what about our founding fathers? They were innovators. Many of them were marginalized in England. Um, okay, so you can, why are the patterns so similar? Because they're based on the human condition. Um, so you can look at that and just remember, teachers have been teaching this forever. That's what I like so much. I'm such a traditionalist in that sense. The idea that I'm part of a tradition um, is such an honor, right? I just, I remember when I decided to go to grad school, I just thought if I could be the, a person who passes on the tradition, but I also pass it on in a way that calls out racism, calls out sexism, right? Um, we were blind and ignorant in the past, and, but we don't have to be. There's nothing in that list of virtues that would necessarily make you racist or sexist or uh, colonialist. It's the corruption of the minds of the people who used it. Okay, so here are the questions. And if any of you, Michael, did you have a question about these questions at all? Uh, no, it was just, I didn't know if we were allowed to um, take a paper topic from both this list and the other list that was on the other paper, or if you wanted it to come specifically from this list. What I want is for you to write something that that you're thinking. <laughs> I mean, I prefer not to have any prompts and just have students talk to me. Okay. I want you to have a free mind, right? I want you to free associate. And some students just need a prompt. So I've learned that. But once you get the prompt, I'm never going to ask you, well, you, I'm never going to say you didn't answer my question, right? I I, there's no box, right? I don't want to put people in boxes. But I can tell you on your paper if you have a thesis and if you are supporting it and if you're supporting it in a way that makes sense to a reader, right? And so, and I do have office hours if you want to talk to me about your outlines or your ideas and we can, you know, hash them out together. I don't require um, office hours, I mean, conferences. I normally do, but it's 
this is all way too condensed and I have, you know, lots of students. Um, and I'm having my friend over and then my kids are coming in from LA and DC and it's just gonna be quite a month. Uh, but I will always find time for you if you want to meet with me. The most important thing to me is that you learn to have a free mind. You learn what's on your mind. And, and I would like you to make philosophy into something you muse about, right? Something you think about when you don't have to be, when, you, you know, when you're done having to think about all the things you have to think about, <laughs> like you're making music. It's like Mozart thinking about music, you know, he had to do this other stuff, but he's always sort of, I, you know, that's how philosophy is for me. I'm just, it's a muse. It's always in the back of my head. So, you know, I'm not going to pretend that all my students are going to get to that point, but definitely I want you to muse about what you think and come up with your own ideas and then support them. But I just picked out patterns. Uh, if some students want to write about parent child family relationships and they come up in all three dialogues, you know, it's interesting. Um, corrupting the youth, what do you think about that? Um, what both these, what about what the masses believe, right? What, um, what do you think about um, sort of mass consciousness in our society and how that affects our ability to have a democracy? Um, what about living by principle, right? What happens sometimes it's great to have principles when Socrates is talking to, in, to Crito. Other times in the Euthyphro, it seems kind of questionable that he's made everything black and white. So we could talk about that. Um, what about the court system? Um, there's the question of whether in, it's been designed pretty well versus the corruption of the people running it. And then, you know, what do you do? when the system breaks down? Do you think Euthyphro was holy? Um, compare them to a public figure in our society. You can use some of those newspaper articles if you, if, you know, some of those are interesting to you and you wanna talk about the, the guy who bombed abortion clinics and everybody protected him and didn't tell the police where he was. Um, a person you know who exhibits the character traits, if you wanna talk about that, that Socrates has those character traits or that Jesus has those character traits. Um, what about coming to college? Um, Socrates and Jesus or Aristotle and Christianity and Jesus, right? Um, and so I, I assume that what you come to the class with, like what's in the back of your mind, will if, will should affect, you know, what it is you actually want to write about. Um, any other questions or comments? It's due on Monday. We'll start Monday's class with your oral presentations. I have a rubric for oral presentations. It's common sense, right? It has four points. You have a main idea. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you know, you present in an organized way and you don't mumble, you know, you project. That's it, you know, it's, uh, some of those rubrics get so dang complicated. Like how could anybody keep all that stuff in their minds? Do you ever have rubrics that you think, oh my gosh, it's way too complicated? Nobody else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think, come on, you're trying to appear to be objective when really this isn't, it's too much. Um, well, I'll let you go. Um, my friend is due to be here anytime. So remember, I'm Marty Beck, and she's Becky Smith. <laughs> Does anybody know what a Mia Farrow haircut is? 
Anybody know who Mia Farrow is? Okay, she had uh -uh. Little, what? She had this no, little uh. inch and a half long haircut. And Becky and I, we had our Mia Farrow haircut. Like we were pretty bad. <laughs> so we'll see you.